Okay. Okay, everyone. Uh, today we're going to learn about uh, the Slaughter Time World War One. I've uh, conveniently named this Fighting Fire with Donuts, um, which we'll get to later. Um, but first, take a piece of paper, um, tell me what you know about the Salvation Army and World War I. They don't have to necessarily be related. If we had any sheet of paper, you don't, you're not going to turn it in. It's just kind of for your knowledge. See where you're at. I'm just going to call on you, um, but first, uh, let's see if these are things that you wrote about. I'll ask you what you wrote about in a second. Um, let's go. Come on. Uh, did you write the Salvation Army as a church? Did you write about its social work? Did you write about its weird terminology? Um, did you write about the infamous brass bands that I love? Uh, World, World War One. did you write about the combatants or the people, uh, the victors and the losers? Uh, who you remember from that? Did you write about, uh, write about the reasons? Uh, and just write about the outcomes. So, these are all things I came up with. What did you come up with, um, Tara? What did you think of? Um, just give me I one thing to the list. Donating clothes to the Salvation Army. Donating clothes, okay. So, I put that in social work, yeah. Cassandra, what did you come up with? Um, well, I thought of the music and then, like, at Christmas time. The music, okay, yeah, I like that. Um, one more. How about Josh? What did you come up with? Probably World War One. Totally. Oh, the same thing? Okay. Anyone come up with a World War One? Remembering from all the way back from last year, technically, if we're in high school. No, I mean, France Ferdinand and everyone got Premier assassinated. Premier yeah, assassinated. Okay. Everyone knows about World War I. Okay, let's recap really quick. Uh, Salvation Army was founded in 1865 in London, England. Um, it was founded by this man, William Booth. He looks like Moses. Um, giant beard. This is all the pictures that depict him have this, uh, this very wise um, old beard type thing. Uh, Booth founded the Salvation Army in England um, with uh, Wesleyan theology. He is actually very close to the Nazarene theology, uh, if you're thinking about it, but the Nazarenes came after the 1900s. So technically, Booth was the first one to kind of found this um, this new type of generational thing. It came from the, it came after the Second Great Awakening in America, um, but much later, right? So you're, you're thinking about it like 20, 30 years after the Great Awakening, and he's doing what the Great Awakening was doing in America, just simply in England. Um, so let's go on from that. Let's, the weird things about it that makes it uh, different from most churches is that it's a top-down structure. Booth was in charge of everything. We're going to get into that later. Um, but eventually Booth would uh, die and someone had to take his role. So the general, which is what he was of the army, that's what the weird terminology is, the general would then take the place and he would be in complete control uh, of the army. That's where, that's where things started getting weird. Um, when people have different ideas. So this top-down structure is, is very efficient as long as people understand that the person at the top makes the final decision regardless of whether they like it. Um, some weird terminology you, you'll find is that I'll talk about officers and soldiers and corps. If I say a corps, it really means a church. Officers really mean pastors. Soldiers really mean um, members of the church. So those are just some recap parts. So let's start with the beginning of the war. So we had these leadership splits. Uh, we just talked about Booth's hierarchy, but the problem was that he established this hierarchy, and a lot of people um, said that that's great, but as Booth started to get older, they realized, hey, we kind of need these new ideas. Um, Booth's hierarchy almost stopped the Salvation Army from coming to America. Uh, there's all this stuff that's going on, so they really needed to have a, uh, a way of, of doing things on their own without uh, completely relying on the general to make every decision. Um, so he was, uh, the hierarchy was actually challenged by his daughter, Evangeline Booth, uh, here she is. Um, so she, she challenged it when, when the war broke out, she supported America fully. This is something Booth did not want. Booth wanted uh, the Salvation Army to remain apolitical. It still remains apolitical today, um, but at the time of World War I, uh, Evangelist took this, this fantastic photo, and I love it because she's sitting here posing with an American flag, right? This is like, I'm an American. She's staring down the camera. She's like, look, challenge me, I'm an American. Um, so she really put all her support behind America. That was the important part uh, of this, is that she challenged the hierarchy. And the reason she could do this is because Booth, William Booth, her father, passed away in 1909. 
Uh, so she had the ability to then say, hey, just a few years later, we can fully support America in this. Um, the reason she did this is because she said that American boys are going to France, so we, as American salvationists, need to support them. Uh, this, was, this was a big shift, it was a big change, because if you were saying that you're supporting a country, there were already salvationists in all the other countries that were uh, fighting the war, specifically Germany. They had um, a big uh, salvationist who came and founded the Salvation Army in America was doing work in Germany at the same time as she did this. Uh, so it was very, very conflicting um, ideas that were going on. Uh, so IHQ, the international headquarters, said, hey, let's be, you know, we, do, we don't really want to do this, but she kind of ignored them. Um, luckily, it didn't do anything bad, but if she uh, played this wrong, it would have been costly the Salvation Army. Uh, let's start with uh, getting, uh, continuing the beginning of the war, I just talked about all that. So General Pershing, does anyone know who General Pershing is? Just by chance, he has a uh, middle school named after him here in San Diego. Uh, anyway, General Pershing was the leader of the American uh, forces, but he was, uh, he was the domestic leader, so he was uh, essentially the Eisenhower, I guess you could say. He didn't really, or not the Eisenhower, he is, um, uh, he was the general that stayed in America and, sh and sent people over. So, General Pershing was actually the person who approved the Salvation Army to go over, and rumor has it um, that he, that Evangeline Booth went and knocked on the door of the White House uh, for two weeks straight, uh, because she lived in, she was national, she lived in D.C., so she went and knocked on the door of the White House in the 1900s, right after the war started, and said, hey, we need to send uh, Salvation Army people over there, can you send, can we go with your troops? And uh, for two weeks, they kept turning her away uh, until finally they said, you know what, why don't you go ask General Pershing? It's kind of like a, you know, sweep you away. And if he says yes, yes. So she goes over to General Pershing, and General Pershing uh, says, yeah. Uh, he says, yeah, let's do it, because she, General Pershing was helped out in the, uh, in the great San Francisco fire and earthquake just a few years uh, earlier. He lost everything, and the Salvation Army was there uh, helping him out as it went on. Uh, the problem was, the the reason they went to General Pershing was because they had all this other relief work that was already going. Um, the YMCA sent 10,000 people, just men, they sent 10,000 men um, to aid with relief work. And I'll talk about this in the next slide. So the question was, why does the Salvation Army need to exist? So we have the YMCA here, they're going to send out, they're going to be like the, the men that move everything. Uh, we don't want to have the people in the army moving stuff, they're tired, um, they're, they're fighting the war. So the YMCA men are there to help uh, move stuff around, they're there to feed the men when they can, etc. Uh, the Red Cross was there to uh, train medics, to be medics, uh, to be there at the front lines, but also the back lines where they can train people. So the question was, where does the Salvation Army fit in? And that's why they were very hesitant uh, to send us. So that's why I sent them over to Pershing. The Pershing said, it's okay. Um, so we're going to talk about that in a second. But first, what do you see? Take a minute, look at it, observe everything. I know what I see. Probably can call it. Look at everything in the picture. You're probably going to see things that I don't see. Um, box. Hmm? The box. Dr. Kim, what do you see? These boxes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the boxes, if you can see them, they're very tiny uh, Salvation Army symbols on them, which means that it's always, obviously a Salvation Army thing. Um, AJ, how about you? Donuts. Donuts, yeah, there you go. Donuts are giant. And big, um, we're talking about donuts today. So the donuts and coffee, uh, if you can't read this, it does say free. Um, so they often gave stuff out for free or very little because they just accepted donations. Um, did anyone notice Uncle Sam? Okay. Um, <laughs> Uncle Sam? <laughs> right, and then um, we have another caricature of Britain as uh, the flag right there. Mm. So it's very uh, supporting of the, uh, these nations, which is very different. Um, but remember actually this one, remember hot. Okay, next one, this little blurry picture. It's a bit harder to see as an older picture. <laughs> okay, Amber, how are you? What, what in this can you let me know that you see? Um, there are a lot of women helping. Yeah, lots of women. Uh, these little groups right here, that's one set of women, that's another set of women. Uh, who's in between them? Uh, Cassandra. But this group or this group, can you even okay. distinguish? Yeah, they, it, they are soldiers. I know it's very difficult to see. It's a, um, it's a very blurry photo, but these are soldiers that would go uh, into these hostels. Uh, the important part that you should notice is that all of this, uh, there's no money sign, right? It's not asking for any money. Uh, most of the time you would think that a hostel or a, or a hotel would advertise how much they're, 
their, uh, the cost is. There is no cost that is listed. Uh, all the numbers that are up here are just the street numbers. Okay, last one. This one's a bit weirder. My first question will be, where do you think this is? Where do you think this is? New York City. New York, yeah. Yeah, that's what I think. There's nowhere, I mean, technically here it says New York, if you're really observant. Um, my other way that I was noticing is that all of them are wearing hats of the age, uh, and you'd only really wear that in a big city. There's no reason to wear that anywhere else. Um, this, she's the normal lassie, right? The normal Salvation Army lassie, and then the rest of her Salvationists are here. There's another one here as they come down. Uh, so yeah, so all three of those are going to the home front, which has three H's. Uh, huts, hostels, and homecoming. Look at how that all works together. So first we're going to talk about the huts. That was the first picture that I showed you. Um, huts were places of rest for the men. Huts were places of, it was like a coffee shop. The Salvation Army was, um, and still is, uh, anti, um, excuse me, uh, anti-alcoholic, so they don't, they don't really want it to be like a bar. Um, so what they said instead was this is like a place of rest, like a coffee shop, it's a place where the men could come together, um, they could get really discounted food, uh, and it was good food, it was made by people there, they weren't just kind of like mass producing, they couldn't at this time, so it was just a place of rest for them. Um, they were always established outside of these army camps, um, which, which grew very quickly when, uh, the arm, when America joined the war. Uh, and so these army camps were places where the men had nowhere else to go, so if they went off, uh, if they went off base or off site, they had the, the Salvation Army huts to go to. The hostels are the next thing, that was the second picture I showed you. Um, these were actually free places to sleep for men and their families, so I'm going to show you another picture later. Um, but it was very important for the, the men to have a free place to stay when they got back from the war. Um, they were able to stay wherever the ships landed. Uh, they had a free room, and eventually they had free um, telegraph and free postage service provided by the Salvation Army. So they could let their family know they were there, they could let their family know before to come meet them somewhere, their family could stay with them for a day or two in a new city, it was free, um, all because, all for the men. Um, they're often paired with the huts, so actually sometimes you'd have a hut underneath a hostel, they were just kind of in the same building, other times you'd have a hut by itself, and then a hostel in another building, it just depended on what they could get their property on. Um, homecoming is what you brought all this stuff together, so women who did not go to France um, were at the docks there, whatever, they were on 24-hour call, uh, and they would go, and they would be some of the first people that uh, the American soldiers would see, regardless of the day, um, especially the bo boats would get in at all times of the day, sometimes it would be like 1 o'clock in the afternoon, people would be around, sometimes it would be like 11 o'clock at night, they have no one, so the Salvation Army uh, men and women were there to greet them. They said, hey, come down to our hostel, you can get... Um, uh, we're going to celebrate you, we're going to give you some free food, we're going to give you a free telegraph so we can let you know your family here that you're safe, um, all that stuff. So all this was offered for free, and it was um, offered for free for a reason I'll get to in a bit. So here's some pictures. Camp Lewis is one of the biggest camps that the Army uh, had during the war. Camp Lewis, I believe, was in the south, I think, like Georgia or Alabama, one of those. Um, so this is giant giant place. The bottom is going to be uh, what the hut was and the top is going to be the hostel. Um, so it says rooms for visitors, there's a lunch room which is going to be on the bottom, uh, there's restrooms, and it says everyone's welcome if you can kind of read that. So all of this uh, is welcoming people. They just took this picture posed, obviously. Um, there is a brass band. There's a brass band which Salvation Army is famous for, but it's not. It's the Army band. You look at the different uniforms. Here's some Salvationists here standing in the front. So all of this um, was done for free. The Salvationists raised enough money so that they could uh, provide this for the troops. This is what the normal hut would look like at home. Um, you had men just kind of relaxing, lounging around. They had newspapers. They had a place to play. There was often a piano somewhere in the room. People would play hymns on it. Um, there was free food when it came. So all this, all this was happening just for the troops. And the troops really loved it. Um, but it wasn't as famous for the, uh, for the later for when they were in France. The reason they could do this is because they are part of the War Services Campaign. Now, the War Services Campaign was a bunch of United Nonprofits. So if you can read this, there's like six or seven that are just represented in these flags. Uh, there's another list that I'll bring up in a bit. But they're all together and they all wanted to raise um, a ton of money. Actually, they wanted to raise $170.5 million in the, 19, in the 19 teens, which is a crazy amount of money. Uh, and they, did, they accomplished most of that goal, and they, they used that for um, supplying troops uh, with relief, they used that for home um, activities, so like they had to pay their own people, but that was very minuscule, they had to like do everything for the troops. 
So this was um, simultaneously helping people at home and pe helping people abroad. These were different than war bonds, but they were very similar to war bonds. When you bought them or uh, you signed off on it, you'd pay like five dollars and put it into the to this, and it would go to this fund um, with it. So here we get uh, what some of the groups were. They're all listed on here, but here you get the, this number, and it's close 170. Uh, and a half million dollars, which is crazy. So you have both YMCA and the YWCA. YMCA sent all their men over. The YWCA stayed here. They helped out. A lot of women took up farming. A lot of women took up all the jobs that the men left. Um, just like when we think of World War II, when all the, all the women took up those jobs, it was, but this was basically just the YWCA that was doing all that work. Um, the Salvation Army here, I don't know why it's separated. There are these little marks. The same with the Jewish Welfare Board, I don't know. But all of these are listed on here with their flags. Here's the YMCA, the YWCA, Salvation Army is hidden, um, the National Catholic War Council, here's the Jewish Welfare Board, and the American Library Association. So all of them uh, were working together in this, in this nonprofit. They really wanted to, um, to give relief work to men. Uh, the thing was a massive success. Uh, people gave tons of money and they kept giving money and actually what they would do is what still goes on with nonprofits is they focus it on days so they'd say like between May 19th and May 26th we're going to raise a million dollars and they'd, they'd go and they campaign very hard and people would uh, pull that together and raise all of it. The reason the Salvation Army was able to accomplish this was because of leadership. I already talked a little bit about Evangeline Booth um, but she was the one that headed up the, the Home Services Fund. Here's a great picture of her. Uh, again in a military-like uniform. Now, the Salvation Army uniform is very military-like, but there are some key features in this that I want to look at. Um, right here, she's wearing a medal. Salvationists do not wear medals. So she's wearing a medal saying that I'm an American. This, right, I'm an American, we're fighting a war. She's wearing a hat that is more um, like the, the soldiers would wear, right? It's not something that the, the Salvationists would wear. Salvationists would wear bonnets. Those are very um, low-key. I want to say that they're more feminine. So she's wearing this hat, she really wants to look like a military leader, she's holding papers, she looks firm, off to the distance, so she's really in this uh, war thing. And here she is, she's going to give a speech, um, if you can see down here, here's the, they would fund uh, May, 6, May 19th to 26th, so they'd go as, as fast as they could um, uh, for a short period of time to concentrate as much money as they could get. The Salvation Army actually ended up um, raising $12.5 million uh, during the course of the war. Uh, just for those relief work uh, alone. It didn't go to anything else, uh, so it was crazy enough. We talked about General Pershing and how she was successfully uh, did both General Pershing and the Home Services Fund um, at the same time, so she was really driving uh, the Salvation Army going to France. She came to America, like we see here, um, and she sent Colonel William Barker, who would make the defining decision on how uh, the Salvation Army remembered. So what he said um, as he went to France, he saw that all the men were kind of ragged. If, we, if I go all the way back to that uh, diagram, we had the YMCA that had the, the men, uh, like, force, right? All the men that could move stuff. We had the Red Cross that was there helping uh, physically, but there was no one there to help emotionally. And so what Barker said is that the troops needed to be mother. The troops needed to have a place that felt like home, where they could go and they could relax, and they could really feel like they were not at war. Uh, knowing that they were at war, but they could have people to talk to that weren't just their soldiers, they could have people to cook for them, they could have people that really were a mother to them and, uh, and a family to them. So that's what he said. Um, and no one was doing that. And if you remember, the French got very upset and revolted because they were living in terrible conditions. And this, I can argue, is that one of the things that why the Americans didn't revolt from their terrible conditions was one, they weren't there as long, and two, they had um, the Salvation Army people that were there uh, to mother them. So we were on the front lines. Uh, here's some more donuts. I'll pass them out in a second. Uh, here's some more donuts. Uh, but this is what a hut would look like, uh, at least in pictures. Uh, there are actually worse huts than this. Uh, as you can see, it's just a tent in the background. Um, it's usually, they did whatever they could do, and the, the huts were at the front line. Um, they were often shelled. They often had to go into cover. There are many uh, stories in the primary sources that say, like, a hut was bombarded, and they lost, like, a wall of the hut. Um, some would just do it on bombed-out buildings, and they kind of just put up what they could to keep it warm and keep it away from the rain. Um, others, it was just like a slab foundation, and then they put up tents. Um, some were like lucky and got an entire basement where they could keep warm and they could get instruments. Um, so all of that was there. They had these canteens um, as well. So the canteens were what the YMCA used, but the canteens also were used by the Salvation Army, and they would drive um, to places where the huts couldn't go and serve the men. There's actually one story where uh, a Salvation Army canteen ran out of food, 
and a YMCA uh, canteen drove right next to it and just started keep serving the men. Um, so that they did work together, and it wasn't like this competition, which might, we might have seen like that. Um, yeah, so this is a place to relax, uh, read, eat, and worship. They, they did worship, but they didn't really focus on the worship. It was, uh, it was more of just this relief aspect. But the women that went, the men and women that went, had this new attitude of servitude. They were very young. Um, they're, most of the women that went over were between the ages of like 16 and 28, so very young. Um, and they went over uh, just to do it, just to serve, and they did not do it for any personal gain. They weren't paid to do this. Uh, the only thing, the only things that really paid them was that they could eat. That was about it, and then they could sleep in the in the hut. Uh, so yes, yeah, so the big differences between relief work and evangelical work. This is where this is one of the instances where the Salvation Army shifted from evangelical work to relief work. Now it's recognized more for its relief work than its evangelical work. Most people do not see the Salvation Army as a church; they see it as a relief organization helping the poor, helping the needy. So this is one of the cases why it's like that, because all the men came back and they remember these women um, that are for relief. So, we're getting to the donut girls. Um, I have donuts today, so as I explain this, um, one of you guys can come up or I can pass around, whatever you like, but they're free. So come while I talk, because uh, I, I don't have as much time to as I would like. So come grab donuts. So I'm going to talk about this. The Donut Girls um, were Salvationist women that traveled to France. Uh, the Salvation Army, I remember, remember that I said that the YMCA sent 10,000 troops over. The Salvation Army only sent less than 500. They sent less than 500 people. So 10,500 and the Salvation Army is more remembered for it. That should say something. There were more men than women. Uh, men went over in, in Great drove, but the women kept diaries, so remember the women. There's another reason you remember the women. The men that got there, uh, when they got there, there was all they saw was men. They saw the YMCA, and then they saw the Red Cross nurses, but the Red Cross nurses were bad people to see, because that meant you were injured. So when they see the, when they see the Salvationist woman, it's like home. That's home. That's, a, that's an American woman that I can talk to about anything I want to talk to. Um, so here's a great picture. I like this picture because the doughboy or the uh, or the American soldier is super happy that he now has a donut uh, to go with the woman. She's called a lassie. Uh, as you can see, she's just wearing khakis. She was wearing what the rest of everyone else would wear, um, and she's carrying donuts. And I'll explain uh, how we created donuts in a second. Um, but the reason that the, the reason that we know the most about the the donut girls because they wrote diaries. Um, there are two women specifically that I researched was Ethel Rentington or Ethel Renton and Florence Turkington. Um, There's a third one, but she didn't really write as much. So these two really wrote uh, about their experiences. They wrote about traveling to France. They wrote about how the men thought. They wrote about what they thought. Sometimes they were terrified. Sometimes they felt great. Um, they actually often said that um, many, many of their diaries, many of the stories would put between that every hut that created donuts would make between 10,000 and 12,000 donuts a day, and there's only three people in a hut. So one person's cooking, one person's passing it out or cleaning. So one person would make 10,000 or 12,000 donuts a day. Think about that. Uh, with, like, you know, in the middle of a war zone without any clean things, and you have to cook it all by yourself. Uh, the donuts were actually improvised. So they got over there and they started doing relief work, and they're thinking, okay, what can we give the men? We can give them coffee. Coffee kind of sucks. So, like, coffee helps, but it's not like something that's American. So one day, someone said, hey, what if we got lard? What if we made donuts? And the donuts are what uh, imprinted on the men with the Salvish, with the, with the girls. So they, the Salvation Army was the only one who cooked donuts. And they made donuts, actually, in one of the hats, uh, one of the helmets of the men. They just turned it over, and they started cooking because they didn't have really something to fry it in. Um, the recipe is online if you still want to do it. It's just like a generic cake donut. Um, so they started making that, and it was a giant hit. It spread like wildfire across the front lines. The Salvation Army didn't think it was going to do that. So they passed the recipe along uh, to as many people as they could. And some, just one person, I think it was Renton, actually decided, hey, what if we made donuts? And, uh, and it just, just worked. It was, a, it was an amazing success. Uh, the donuts, the reason the success, according to me, is that it was a symbol of home. Donuts were not something you could get in Europe, right? We don't think of, like, French donuts. Right, American donuts is what, is what it is. So the donuts were a symbol of home. The women were a symbol of home because they were mothers. They were mothers to the men. And they saw them as nothing else except mothers. So when they went to them, regardless of their age, they always saw them as like 40-year-old people that were there to take care of them, to give them food, to give them water, to give them shelter, to give them entertainment, to, to distract them from what was going on in the real world. So the women that went were these mothers. Uh, 
Here are some great pictures. I believe this is Ethel. Uh, she took this picture holding all these donuts. This is like one batch, and she'd make uh, probably close to 100 of these, or not, uh, uh, 10 or 12 of these in a day. Um, so she'd make a ton of it, I mean, 10,000 donuts. That's a ridiculous amount. Uh, and then they took it, this is that picture, and they put it onto uh, something that was advertising propaganda. So it's the same person that kind of uh, brightened up her face a little bit, but all this uh, was used to remember the Salvation Army. The donuts were used to remember the Salvation Army. Here is a great picture because your eye, my eye at least, is drawn to the women, right? Does anyone notice someone who is not a soldier in this picture that's not the woman? Yeah, go ahead. The guy the drink? The yeah, this guy. Yeah, he's giving it. Um, he's actually a, he's a Salvationist. He's not just a soldier. Um, so he has red on his shoulders. That means that he's probably an officer. They're probably they're paired together. Um, but the focus of this is on the donuts and coffee, which we see is that the donut, the donut girls are remembered, and she's, she's the main focus. So that's how uh, it gets remembered. The <coughs> impact that this has uh, is still relevant today. Um, so as you can see, the Saturday Evening Post, a giant newspaper, uh, talked about the, uh, the Salvation Army, the Donut Girls. Um, and then this is another thing, another uh, propaganda to say, hey, these women are doing everything. And, and if you see in this picture, she's on the front lines, right? She's, that's the barbed wire. She's there. She's in it. She's not just kind of um, back and waiting for the men to return. They were there with the men um, as they came back and forth from the lines. Uh, so the impact it had was that it was extremely positive for the soldiers. They remembered everything uh, that happened. They said, you know, this is great. We really want um, to remember these women. And so this became what I will call a high point in Salvation Army history. Uh, everything uh, that led up to this uh, pushed the Salvation Army to be one of the biggest nonprofit organizations. In the 1990s, it was ranked number one in nonprofit uh, relief work. Um, it's remembered. So all of this is remembered history. The men that would come back. Now there are only, you know, 400 people that went, 400 something, and then of that, less than 200 were women. So less than 200 women impacted the entire army because they they remember as these mothers, as these donut girls. People still um, donate today because uh, my girlfriend works in um, in the marketing department of the Salvation Army, and she still has people give donations because their grandfathers told them stories of the Donut Girls and Salvation Army, saving them uh, from, from it. So everything that I'm going to say, that's what I was going to say. So all the veterans praised it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the donuts, but that is the brief history of the Donut Girls.